Here's the funny thing about people. We all like to look good. To make a good impression. To show everyone else we have it all together. Even though none of us do. The only way to pull this off is to put something else on. And that something is called a mask. A mask can help you get a job. I have over 12 years of consumer electronics experience. Playing video games in my parents' basement. It can make you look smarter. Organizational energies to maximize corporation synergy. I have no idea what I'm saying. You do not look fat in those jeans. So that's why they call it a muffin top. We all wear masks from time to time, but the craziest place we put them on is in church. Hello, brother! Amen! Greetings to you on this day that the Lord has made. Something about it makes us want to look our best. I'm fine! Sound our best. He hath blessedeth me so verily. And make like everything is perfect. Things are great! But behind every perfect mask is a perfectly messed up life. People with hearts that are empty. Confused, addicted, hopeless, helpless, and hurting. People who think But here's the thing. This is exactly the kind of life where God shows up. Messes are his specialty. The one thing God can't work with is a mask. So around here we have a saying. It's okay to not be okay. Nobody's perfect. But grace is available. We believe God doesn't love us if or because. He loves us anyway. We all like to look good to others. We like to make a good impression. But when it comes to God, the best impression we can make is to just be you. What's up, Mountain Movers Church? We got a small crowd this morning, but you are mighty, you are powerful. This is going to be a great message. I appreciate you guys getting out in the rain and making God's presence your priority. We will do our very, very best to make you feel like when you leave that you have been uh, stretched and improved upon and that there will be a better version of you walking out that door. That is our mission and that is our privilege as your pastor. So we are starting a new series called Masked and uh, this is going to be a fun series. Um... When I think about masks, I think about some of the masks I wore as a little, wee little lad. And I think about, I think, uh, the reason I liked wearing these masks, I think, is because I got to forget who I was and pretend I was someone I wasn't. And I like to just kind of disappear and become someone else and just, you know, just kind of put that on for a little bit. And I I liked, you know... uh, you know, for my brother Zach right here, I was a Superman guy, a big DC, you know, a Superman, <laughs> Superman was, <laughs> he was the guy, and I like Spider-Man, you know, uh, but I also, there was also one other, um, I call him a superhero, he's technically not, but one person I like to dress up as was the Lone Ranger, <laughs> that's right, high silver away, and that's his sidekick, Tonto, I like dressing up as him, and um, as a matter of fact, I think I brought my Lone Ranger mask this morning. Actually, if you like, go to the next picture. I'm going to put it on for you. Brad, actually, this is actually Brad when he was like six years old because he really thought he was the Lone Ranger. And not only that, but I really think this is kind of funny. So like all of his life, he always wanted to have a horse that was white named Silver, okay? And so this is actually our horse. Silver is in our pasture right now. This is Pastor Brad riding in a tank top and shorts because... God gave him the white silver. No, seriously. Somebody, (laughs) no, seriously. Somebody gave me that horse. It's true. And his name was Silver already. I did not name the horse Silver. And he said, I always wanted a white silver because I always dressed up as a Lone Ranger. As the Lone Ranger. Guys, I'm just telling you right now, God knows the desires of your heart. And this is my destiny. I'm serious. I'm like a, like, seriously, like I'm a Western ninja. The problem is, okay, for and I've got back up. No, go back to the picture of, of me as a little kid. As a little kid. See, here's my deal. If I can't kick your butt, I'll just shoot you. <laughs> I'm 
just saying, if I can't kick your butt, I'll just shoot you. The funny thing, Western though, Ninja. The funny thing is, your mask there actually fit you better because if you guys all noticed when he put this on yesterday after I bought it, it's a kid's mask. It's a kid's mask. So so those eyes small. look like they're this <laughs> far apart. I can't see. I can't see very good. I was like, <laughs> you're gonna have to get that thing off real fast, so or like you're gonna lose all the blood from your head. I okay? think this is what Jake was talking about when he said he's known me for a long time, but he's never known this part of me, like. I've got the hat, the mask, the long rifle, the six-shooter, and there I am in my underwear. <laughs> but he's been to camp with me. We were counselors together. He saw me in my underwear. It's not a big deal. I'm just saying, when, you counsel, when, you, when you're a counselor at camp, you see everything. And I'm just going to tell you right now, if you thought about volunteering as a counselor, don't go the same week Willie does, because that'll just scar you. I'm just saying. You just don't want any of that. I'm just saying stay home, because life change can happen through someone else. No, I didn't. That's you got funny. off. Now you move That's on. That's really Okay, so masked, right? So we, <laughs> we what, what am I even preaching about? I don't even know what I'm preaching on. So we wear masks because a lot of times we, we get, oh, I know what I was going to say. Hey, this is really good. The Lone Ranger, did you guys know that the Lone Ranger uh, actually was a Texas Ranger, the storyline behind him? Uh, he was a Texas Ranger and... All of the other Texas Rangers got killed by bad guys. And then he was the only one left. He actually escaped and he was wounded. And guess who saved him? Tonto. Tonto saved him. And he nursed him back to health. And he went back to get vengeance on everybody else. And he went, you know, so that his identity wouldn't be detected. And he went as the Lone Ranger. And picked all these guys off, which I think is really cool. Went and killed everybody single-handedly uh, with vengeance. That's a pretty awesome story. But then he continued to just wear the mask. And he continued to fight crime and chase bad guys down. But he held on to that identity. And everywhere he would go, you know, if you've seen any Lone Ranger reruns, they would always say, who is that masked man, right? Because everywhere he went, he would go as this masked man, continually hiding his identity. But, you know, the, the, the idea here is I think that we all do that a lot. It's we, we, we hide behind a mask that we wear with people, and we wear the mask with God. And we do it all the time. Like, we've become really, really good at just covering things up, at hiding things. And I think for all of us, um, we've just gotten really good at it, unfortunately. Um, and in this series, I think something we need to understand just right out of the shoot is, guys, we all have issues. I have issues. You definitely have issues. <laughs> you have issues. We all have issues, right? We've all got stuff, but we've just gotten really good at covering it up. And I think for some of us, you know, there's more to cover up than for others, and that's okay. For some of us, if it were like cleaning out your garage or a storage unit of some sort, for some of us, you know, it might be sweeping out some dust and some light debris. For others, you need to call in like a 30-yard dumpster because there's some really big stuff that you, that you have kept covered up for a long time, and you're just begging that people won't come over and, and like, like, do not open that door right there because if you open that door, all sorts of stuff is going to come falling out. You know, we just, we do that. We hide stuff. We hide the junk in the trunk, but the truth is we don't want to deal with the truth. We don't want to address the mess. We, we don't want to get real with ourselves, and we especially don't want to get real with God. It happens every Sunday morning when we get in God's presence like this. You might read words on the wall during worship, and you're like, I'm not ready to deal with that. And you're like, what happened to my mask? I know. And you're like, not going to deal with that, and you're like, mask on, Right? Uh, we start preaching the word and we open up the word of God and we bring the word to you. And every time it happens to me, it happens to you. When we come into contact, when we have an encounter with the word of God, he always speaks to our heart and he says, hey, I'm wanting to deal with that part of your heart. And a lot of times, what do we do? Mask on, like, no, God, not ready to deal with that yet. You mean like you want me to actually forgive? When they've done me so wrong, like, like you, you want me to, you want me to, to, to be thankful, and you want me to stop complaining. I'm not, I'm not ready to do that yet. Mask on, and, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Whenever we come into contact with God's word, anytime we encounter His presence, He speaks to our heart. And so many times, you and I, man, we just put the mask on. But, but here's what God's trying to do. 
He's trying to get us to take the mask off with him because there's a better version of us that God is trying to draw out of us. He's trying to cause us to become that person that he created us to be. I want to ask you a question. I think it's a powerful question that if you'll be real with yourself and you'll ask yourself this question right at the beginning of the message, I think it will really, really help you. Are you living your life to the fullest degree of God's intentions? Are you living your life to the fullest degree of God's intentions? Are you experiencing everything that God has for you? Are, have you capitalized on becoming the ultimate version of who God really wants you to be? Well, the answer is going to be found in removing the mask and getting real with yourself, getting real with God. So that's what we're going to do in this series, and we're going to start it today, all right? Part one, we're going to take baby steps, okay? So this is going to kind of be like group therapy, all right? For all of you guys who never wanted to go to therapy, we all need therapy. We all, we need, all therapy. need counseling, we okay? We all need counseling. So here's what you're going to do. I'm not going to make you do anything crazy. Just say, I, I have, have issues. issues. All right, you just took a baby step into admitting that you need this, all right? We all have issues, Brad said it, and today in part one, this is our title, Getting Real with God. Next week, we're going to talk about getting real with yourself, and heaven forbid we get real with one another, right? Because that would just be going way too far. But we're going to talk about why is it so hard for us to get real with God? Really, when you think about it, the head knowledge, you and I both know that God knows everything, does he not? Do you agree? God knows everything. He created the world. He knows the thoughts I have before I think them. He knows the words I'm going to say before they come out of my mouth. He knows what I did yesterday. He knows what I'm going to do tomorrow. God knows it all. Yet we still try to hide our issues from God. We try to act like we've got it all together, not only in front of one another, but even with God. Now, I'm going to take you back right now, all the way to the beginning. You go with me if you have your word to Genesis chapter 1. I don't want to begin to show you what we were actually put on this earth to do, all right? Because at, the longer we live, I honestly believe this, when we're little kids, we like to dress up and put on masks because it's fun to be someone we're not. But the older we get, we actually start really wearing those masks and we become terrified to let anybody know who the real you or the real I, that's not good grammar. <laughs> I was wondering, I was wondering well, where you were going go with that. that I'm like, how's right? she going to finish that one up? <laughs> Sometimes it comes to you and then it doesn't come out the way you had it in your head. You know what I'm saying? But it, the fact is, the older we get, we start wearing these masks and it becomes very difficult to take them off. And so as we were studying for this, it was like, how can I help people not understand that God created you with a purpose. We say that all the time. It almost becomes cliche. God created you with a purpose. God has a good plan for your life. But I want to take you all the way back to the beginning and tell you what his plan was all along. So Genesis 1, verses 26, it says this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. We're going to pause right here. I want you to look at something. If you have your Bible or you're looking up here on the screen with me, it says, let us make human beings in our image. Those words are plural, okay? If you haven't studied the word of God too much, I wanted to point this out so that we don't miss it. This is talking about the Trinity, okay? That's a really big word, but it simply just means this. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all together, three in one, were present at creation, all right? So it's important to understand your word. So it says, God says, let us make people or human beings in our image, to be like us. Who are we supposed to be like? God. That's a tall order. Moving on. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the wild animals and the earth, the small animals that scurry around the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Here's what I want you to understand. When God spoke you into existence, when he created human beings, he did so to say, I want you to be the reflection of me to the world. I need you to be whole and complete, lacking nothing. And it's kind of like the question Brad just posed a second ago. If I were to ask you, do you feel whole? Like, do you feel complete? Like, there's nothing else that you need. I think the answer for all of us would have to be no. I don't. 
I hope we're working on it, but yet that's God's desire is that we would be whole and complete, lacking nothing. But here's the interesting thing. We all know this, and that is that there's an enemy that came into the picture. The Bible says in John 10 and 10 that the enemy comes but to seek, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And you know, I use this all the time, but I want you to know, even as a pastor, I quote this to myself all the time because the enemy wants to steal my joy. He wants to kill the purpose that God has for my life, and he wants to destroy every, every part of the reflection that I would have to the world of God being on the inside of me and his glory being radiated. He wants to destroy that. But Jesus came that we would have a life, and not just any life, but we would have a life that's more abundant. To me, when I think about an abundant life, I think about somebody who has peace in the middle of a storm. I think about somebody who has overflowing joy, no matter the circumstances that are around them. That's the kind of life that Jesus laid down his life so that we could have. But the enemy moves in and he ambushes us, kind of like happened with the Lone Ranger. We don't see it coming. And here's where I want you to notice. Go to Genesis 3. As we look at Adam and Eve, as soon as the enemy makes his way in and he ambushes, what happens? It says at the moment that they're At that moment, what moment was this? This was the moment that they had disobeyed. This was the moment where they had eaten the fruit. They had disobeyed God. It says their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame. Why do we ever feel shame? We feel shame when we do something that we regret. We feel shame when we do something that disappoints or offends. And in this case, they were offending God. They disappointed God. They felt this shame come over them. It says that their nakedness. And I want you to understand something. The reason that God created them naked without clothes, he could have made the most beautiful clothes for them to wear like royalty, but it was a sign of what God wanted, and that was transparency. He wanted nothing between them and him. He wanted a pureness, a transparency. But as soon as shame enters the picture, as soon as disobedience happens, immediately they say, no, 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 we need to be covered. And look what they do. They sew fig leaves together to create a costume to cover themselves. They create a mask. This was the very first mask ever created. Why? They were trying to cover the present reality. Let it sink in. They were trying to cover the present reality that what they had just done had now was going to bring offense to God, was going to bring a separation between them, and they wanted it to just go away. Have you ever had something happen and you're like, I wish I could just make it go away. I wish I wouldn't have said what I just did, but yet it's gone, and I just want to pretend like it didn't happen. And a lot of times, people in relationships with one another, it's like, you know what? I'm just going to pretend like that didn't happen. We're not going to deal with it, and hopefully in a couple days, you'll have amnesia and forget, right? And that doesn't happen. It doesn't, but we put these masks on like it does and that everything's okay. Go on to verse 8. It says this. After they made their costume, they made their mask. It says, when the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife, they heard God walking in the garden, so they hid from the Lord among the trees. Then God says this pondering question, and he says this, where are you? Now, I want you to think about this again. If God knows everything, then God knew where they were, right? Right? It's like a parent playing hide-and-seek with a four-year-old. My nephews come over to the house. We play hide-and-seek, and and it's not like I don't know where they are. (laughs) And I'm like, where's Captain at? And he's down there hiding, you know, like smiling like he really has done a good job. Adam and Eve were hidden, and yet God obviously knew in the physical sense what tree they were under. But that wasn't what he was asking. What he was asking is so much deeper. He was saying, where are you spiritually? Where are you emotionally? What's the state of your soul? I want to get so much deeper. I know you put this costume on, but I want to get past that. I want to go back to the transparency. You tell me what you're feeling right now. Why don't you tell me that there's shame and guilt and, and all this junk built up because of the decision you just made? Because here's the thing. God was the one pursuing them. If God was so disappointed at the actions that they had just taken, he could have said, I'm done with you. I will wipe you off the face of the earth. But that's not what he did, did he? He still came down like normal. I love this. God was setting them up. He was like, this is what we do. Every night I come down and we go for a walk. So like you screwed up and I know it, but I'm still coming down. And we're going to deal with this. All right? We are going to deal with this. Sometimes as parents, you step in with your teenagers and you're like, hey, I found something right? Maybe you don't have teenagers. And you're like, we're going to deal with this. Is this a little awkward? It is a little bit awkward. We're going to talk this through right now, buddy. We're going to have a conversation. That's what God was doing with Adam and Eve. He's like, why don't you just come clean with me? Why don't you just tell me that you messed up? Because guess what? I still love you. 
I still have a plan for you. I still created you to reflect my image, but we got to get this nasty shame and junk off of you. Get that mask off and allow you to be transparent. And it's got to stop first with me. There's a guy in the Bible by the name of Moses, and he is known as the one who was the closest to God ever. And I love his story. If you kind of have heard the story before, if you've ever watched The Prince of Egypt like 20 years ago, that was his story. But basically, there's this little guy, and about the age of maybe three months, he is taken from being, in, being raised by a Hebrew into the Egyptian palace, okay? And all the Israelites are enslaved in bondage in Egypt, and Moses is taken into the palace, and he's raised there, okay? Talk about an identity crisis. His blood is Jewish, but now he's being raised in his, as an Egyptian, And the Bible doesn't really tell us, but I often think a little deeper into the story. It's like, at what point did he realize he didn't look like an Egyptian? As he's out walking around, he's like, I actually kind of look like the slaves. Like, he looks in the mirror, he looks at them, he's like, what's going on? I don't think I'm an Egyptian. I think I'm a Hebrew. And one day it comes out. And all of a sudden now he's dealing with these issues inside of himself because he realizes that his family, the Egyptian family, is bringing so much bondage upon the Hebrews that he begins to have this anger beginning to brew inside of him at the injustice. And so one day he notices this Egyptian beating a Hebrew and he goes out and he takes care of it. And he murders a guy. Not only does he murder him, But he wants to hide it because as soon as we do something wrong, what do we want to do? We go into hiding, okay? So he digs it up and he digs up this pit in the sand and he buries this body and he covers it up and he thinks he's all good until somebody realizes what's going on and they call him out on it. And when they call him out on it, he is not ready to deal with it. Follow me. He is not ready to deal with it. So he runs away and he goes into hiding on the backside of the desert for 40 years years he hides out because he doesn't want to come face to face with what he has done or what God's calling was on his life until one day God said okay kind of like Adam and Eve I'm gonna call you out where are you at Moses and he shows up in this burning bush that's not being consumed and Moses is intrigued and he walks up to it and he's like wonder why the bush isn't being consumed I'm a shepherd and I've never seen this before he walks up and God begins to speak out of the bush which you know that would make you just wet your pants, would it not? Like, you know, you'll walk up, and then it starts talking to you, and you're the only one out here, and God says, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground, and God begins to have this, this moment of transparency to say, listen, it is time for you to come out of hiding. I already know what you did. I know you feel guilt. I know you feel shame. I don't care about any of that. I want you to come real with me, because here's the thing, buddy. I created you for a greater purpose. I created you to be the one who's going to lead the children of Israel out of bondage, but we can't do it while you're back here in hiding on the backside of the desert. So let's get it together. And he begins to become so transparent with God. And then he goes back and he literally does exactly what God had called him to do. And then you come up to Exodus chapter 34 and Brad's going to pick this story up. But this is where Moses begins to show us exactly what God wants every time we come into his presence. Right. You know, you look at Moses and you look at everything that he accomplished and his obedience to, uh, to God. And it was after he had gone into God's presence and went maskless. And I want to show you what happens here in this passage. It's in Exodus 34, verse 34 says, But whenever he went into the tent of meeting, that was this tent that they traveled with, and God's presence was in that tent, to speak with the Lord, he would remove, say remove, remove. the veil, or he, he would remove the mask until he came out again. And Moses recognized that there was something powerful about being in God's presence. And if you look in, you don't, don't turn there, but maybe later today if you have some time, just look at Exodus chapter 33, and you can see where God lays out all these things that he's going to do for Moses and through Moses and for the children of Israel. And he made all these promises, and Moses was like, God, I love the fact that, that you are laying out your promises, and, and I don't take those promises for granted. I love your promises. But more than any of that, what I want is I want the person. I want the person behind the promises. He, he realized that there was something more to God than just what God could do for him. But he realized that God was a person that he could come to know, a person that he could come to understand. And Moses wanted that so desperately. And so when Moses would get into God's presence, let's look at this next verse in 34 and see what happened. 
It says here that he would give the people, when he came out of God's presence after being with God, he would give the people whatever instructions the Lord had given him, and the people of Israel would see the radiant glow. Say radiant glow. And if you have your word out, if you take a note, you need to circle that, you need to highlight it. Why was he glowing? Why was there a radiant glow to Moses' face when he came out of the tent of meeting? Because he was like a solar panel, all right? And when he was in the presence of God, it, it's, it's like when you were little. I don't know if you did this, but I loved those glow-in-the-dark anything. You know, and I would put those objects up to a, a, a light bulb, and I would charge it for a few minutes, and then I'd run into the bathroom and shut the door and kick the light off, and I'd be like, whoa, that's so cool. And I would just be so amazed at how any, anything could glow in the dark like that. And, but that's what happened with Moses. When he would get into God's presence, he was exposed to the glory, the radiating glory of Almighty God. I didn't say this in any other services, but you know the Bible talks about how in heaven we're not going to need sunshine. There will be no sun, but there will be the radiant glow of God's glory that will illuminate and bring light to all of heaven. It will be because of the glowing glory of God. And that's what Moses was experiencing when he was in his presence. But check it out. When he stepped out of the tent and he got around God's people, it said that he would put the veil back over his face until he returned to speak with the Lord again. Why would he do that? Because the glory of God that was all over Moses offended people. They were like, yo, Moses... Man, you are glowing. Like, like, like you, your glowing is freaking us out, and you're really scaring us because people aren't supposed to glow. Okay, it's just weird. So, like, put the mask back on. We don't want to see that. I want to ask you, when's the last time that the glory of God in your life was shining so bright that you made people around you uncomfortable? But that's what God wants. He wants us to get in His presence and remove the mask and get a hold of his glory and become like that glow-in-the-dark object and get charged up with his presence, so charged that when we step out of church on Sunday and we go to work on Monday, that people are like, whoa, hey, come on, man, put a mask on. You are killing me. There's this guy by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. All right, that's a, I know that's a funny name. But I just want to know by a show of hands, has anybody ever heard the name Smith Wigglesworth? Will you raise your hand, please? Really? That's so amazing. I didn't know that so many people knew who he was. The other services, I was amazed at how many hands went up. But if you don't know who he is, let me tell you. Um, so this guy was a plumber, and I think it was the turn of the century. I think it was, um, maybe he was, he, ha he was alive in the 1800s, but really everything that God did that was so amazing in his life was the early 1900s. And uh, he was a plumber by trade, but he was also like an evangelist and a, a preacher. And, and he would go around, and he, God would work miraculously through this guy performing crazy documented miracles. You should really Google this guy and read some of the things that happened. It will blow your mind. A few examples uh, would be he was in a, a, a camp meeting revival type thing, and, and some parents bring their infant that has recently passed away to him. And he was known for being very unique and very eccentric in his approach to healing ministry. He took the baby and drop kicked the baby. And the baby came to life and floated down to the ground. It's documented. You can read up on it. Uh, crazy stuff. People would come with stomach aches and he'd haul off and slug them in the stomach in Jesus' name and they'd be healed. Crazy. Side note, when we were in college... We were married. We were in college. We had this tiny little apartment. He kept whining about his stomach like all day long yeah. over and over this and is over funny. and over. True story. And one day, and he was like, will you please just pray for me? I was like, sure, bam. Punched him right in the stomach. He goes, oh my gosh. I said, you're I not said, Smith. Now you work. have a real reason to <sighs> complain. Like, you're not Smith. Oh, that hurt. It was fun. Good totally times. Totally didn't work at all. Um, other things that happened. His wife died three times, and he prayed over her, and she came back to life true story the third time she said smith let me go i want to go to heaven and i keep seeing it but you keep pulling me back i want to go to heaven true stories 
So one time, this guy, and, and listen, here, we're talking about the glory of God. We're talking about going into God's presence and removing the mask. That's what Smith was known for. Yes, he was a plumber, but he spent most of his time in prayer. He spent most of his time every day in communion with the Lord, like literally doing communion with God. And he would read the scriptures on endless hours. He would read the scriptures, and he would just get in God's presence. He'd remove his mask, and he would let the glory of God radiate through his life. Till one day... He was sitting on a train that was at the train station, and he's reading the paper, and this guy, this passenger, climbs aboard and walks down the aisle and sits next to Smith, and all of a sudden, this guy just starts getting squirmy and really uncomfortable, and finally, he just jumps up and he yells at Smith and says, stop convicting me, and he just walks off the train because the presence of God was so great in Smith's life that he didn't even have to say a word, but sometimes people just being near him would be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to come back to this idea again. When's the last time that the radiant glow of God made people in your world a little uncomfortable? I believe that that's what God wants more than anything, is for us to get in his presence, remove the mask, get the glory of God, and then you go to work and, and maybe, maybe your coworker, maybe the person in the next cubicle over is going through a nasty divorce. And, and, and it means because you've been in God's presence, it might be a little uncomfortable, but you say, hey, you know what? We're going to spend every day at lunch praying, and we're going to believe that God's going to mend this marriage. Amen? It, it, it's about you maybe just yelling across the fence at your neighbor that you know is going through chemotherapy or whatever they might be going through and saying, you know what? I don't have all the answers, but I know the one who does. And, and, and I don't know if God's going to heal you or not, but I know that he can give you peace and comfort and strength and anything that you need. And I'm going to love you through this, and we're going to do this together. Maybe if you would just get in God's presence and remove the mask and let God deal with your junk, that God would use you in a way far beyond what you could ever imagine or think. I want to remind you, last time I looked at my word, I was reminded that we do not belong to ourselves. But we've been bought with a price. Our life is not our own. You're not here to, to breathe air and, and to make money and to build a big house and a career and a title and a position and then die. That's not why you're here. You are here to have a relationship with God, to know God, but then to make him known. He wants to use you in a way that is far beyond what you can imagine or even think, but that those things aren't going to happen, and you're not going to step into the fullness of his glory until you get around his glory, until you get in his presence. You know, you're, you're asking for God maybe to, to use you in an incredible way in public, but you need to get in private with him and remove the mask and just, just let him begin to charge you with his presence like you've never experienced before. And that's our prayer for you today. As we're wrapping up, man, that is our challenge to you today. I asked you a question at the beginning of the message. Are you living your life to the fullest degree of God's intentions? And I hope that you're discontent with the way things are because I know I am. I hope that you're far from satisfied because God has so much more. But we, it's going to take us being like Moses and getting in God's presence and pushing past religion and getting into relationship. I want to read one more scripture to you. It's in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 18. This is the message, and it says this. Whenever, though, we turn to face God as Moses did, God removes the mask, and there we are, face to face. We suddenly recognize that God is a living personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation, that religion is recognized and it is obsolete. We are free from it all, all of us. I love this next part. It says nothing. When we remove the mask, here's what happens. There's nothing between us and God. That's the way God wants it. Like vulnerable and naked and transparent. It is the truth of the state of our soul. God wants us to come to him with all of our junk because he already knows the junk. He just wants us to confess. He doesn't need to hear it because he doesn't know it. He needs us to say it so we can hear it. We need to hear ourselves say, God, I need to address this mess. This is what I'm dealing with. This is where I need your word to cleanse me and make me more like you. And when you do that, it says that our face... Our faces will be shining with the brightness of his face 
And so we will be transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. That is what God wants for you. That is what God wants for me. He wants us to become like him, but we can't do it unless we get around his glory. Let's pray today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would show us what is beneath the surface. That we would be willing, God, to just take that mask off and be real and be transparent with you. That we would do away with religion and that we would just cling to a relationship with you in a real way, God. I pray, Lord, that we would be like Moses, that we would get around your glory and that you would just charge us with your presence, God. And I just pray over each and every one of us as we leave this place today and we go to work this week and we're around neighbors and and friends and family and different uh, people that we just bump into just uh, doing our day. I pray, God, that because we've been in your presence maskless, because we got around your glory, that your glory would make people around us feel uncomfortable, but in a good way in a way that would cause them to see who you are. I pray, God, that we would just remove the mask with you and with others. We love you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you're not a God of religion, but you're a God of relationship. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to do something different today. I want to know if you know of somebody that you work with, somebody that you... uh, that, that you've met recently, maybe someone that's been on your heart that does not know Christ. I want to know if you would just raise your hand and say, I, I know somebody that I've been thinking about. Would you raise your hand? Because I want to pray for that person today. Would you just raise your hand? Amen. Me too. Let's pray for those people today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for those that we know that don't know you. We pray, God, that even now in this very moment, you begin stirring in their hearts, that you would bring the sweet beautiful conviction of your spirit to their hearts and to their mind that you would cause them to be uncomfortable to 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 stir their hearts god and and help them to realize that they need you i pray god that you would use us help us to to say something that would cause them to think about who you are and how bad they need you i pray that our prayers would be powerful as we remember these people in our lives this week as we lift them up, as, as we lift their names up to you, Father God, that you would remember them and that you'd just begin using us as, as vessels, that you'd begin using us for, as conduit for your power to flow through, that we would be able to say something or do something that would just cause them to want to come to you. We love you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, God, that you're calling us to remove the mask. With heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone in this room that would say, I need a, I don't want religion, but I want a relationship with Jesus. Are you in this room? You would say, I, I want to have a real and life-changing relationship with him that's contagious. Is that you? If that's you, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you today. Thank you. Well, church, let's just pray this prayer together, shall we? Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. I know I've sinned. I've disappointed you in so many ways. Please forgive me. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess Him as Lord of my life. Help me to remove the mask. Never to be the same again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, we've got a gift we want to celebrate with you. This is called our Next Step Kit. It's on the left as you exit. Pick it up. It's got a brand new Bible, and it's got a message from Brad and I that's going to help you to understand how to be successful in this journey. Guys, will you put your hands together today? Two people today made the decision to change their eternity by giving their life to Christ. Amen. What's up, Mountain Movers family? Hey, Misty and I wanted to take a quick second just to give everybody an update of what's been happening on the property. That's right. There's a lot happening. So if you look behind us, Obviously, you see the big building is in the dry. This is our new sanctuary to the left. And on my right is the new nursery that is now covered in metal and looking awesome. In a little bit, we're gonna take you inside of both of those buildings and let you see what's going on inside. But before we do, 
We want to show you what's happening out here because you, if you've been on campus, you realize everything's kind of a mess and there's a lot happening with our utilities. So Brad, tell us what's going on outside. So if you look over here to your left, you can see some dirt work being done. You can see that there's a path being cleared through the trees. So this is the Seneca Cayuga Tribe property and they have been bringing a water line down to us. They're gonna round the corner. They've got a, a water project happening and we were able to tap into the water line. Now behind us, what you'll see is our new lateral field. It kind of looks like a mole is out of control, but it's actually 1,450 feet of new lateral field. You can kind of see it out here. It's all installed and we're getting ready to come back and we'll smooth the dirt and it'll be beautiful again. So how many of y'all want to see the new nursery? It's not done yet, but we're going to show you the progress. It is coming along beautifully. Let's I cannot wait for you to see it. So let's go in. All right. So as you can see, this is the foyer. And uh, if you look down, we've got the flooring down. And this is going to be the space where all the parents check in their little ones. There right. are baby babies that are not even up and mobile yet. So this is going to be a beautiful space. You can see the walls are painted. The ceiling is in. You can see the cabinetry back towards the back. That's going to be a beautiful changing table with a sink. This side is crawlers. So they'll be in this space. And then if you follow me quickly, we'll move right back through here. And it's a little dark in this area, the hallway that connects from the crawling room all the way across to our little toddlers. And then we've got two bathrooms. So this is going to be, these are gutted right now, new sheetrock and paint is on the wall. It's going to have all new fixtures, everything brand new. This nursery is due to be open the first part of November and we can't wait for you and your babies to get to experience this new space. All right, so many of you guys have been asking, what's on the other side of that? <laughs> that pastors keep talking about. So we thought we would just take you on the other side of the wall. So if you're standing in the sanctuary on the stage, in the very, very middle of the stage, and you were to walk through the wall, this is where you'd be standing on the other side. So you're in the new sanctuary, um, and we are standing right out, right inside the new double door. So to my right, you can see the cutout where we're beginning. This is gonna be one set of double doors. And to Misty's left, will be the and other. Another set of double doors. So if you turn around, you can get a good shot of this room. The room is at 50%, just about. A lot of the, uh, half of the electric is in now. Everything in the middle section, this is all gonna be seating. So follow us on around, we'll kind of bring you through a tour up front. So we're making our way to the stage. We are. So on this side, you can kind of, if you kind of get a shot on the floor, you can kind of see the cutout right there. This is a side room, and this is basically a backstage room. It's got our electrical panels. It'll also have a lot of the musicians' equipment and um, kind of a tiny little green room for musicians and singers as they make their way onto stage. So here in this middle section, this is all gonna be a stage, and it's gonna be a much bigger stage, about twice as big as our current which will be fabulous because as you know, MMC, we're blessed with an awesome band and they're kind of scrunched right now on that stage. So we're very excited. If you can kind of just do a panoramic, go around the room, you'll see that almost all the stud walls are up. And the next thing that will happen is the rest of the rough end on the electric will be brought in. And then we will call for our 50% inspection, followed by sheetrock going on the walls and then the final electric, and then paint. And we're gonna and stain, then the we'll stain the floors. It's gonna look so beautiful. And we'll be in. And it is our goal, Lord willing, to be in by the middle part of December and to have our Christmas Eve service in this room. That's right. And All you know, right? I just wanna say real quick, you know, none of this would have been possible if, if it wasn't for everybody just being really, really open to God speaking to them. As God said, okay. this is this is what part I want you to play. This is this is the sacrifice that I want you to make. This is the amount of money that I want you to dedicate towards my temple. And so many families have been so faithful to do that. Right. And because of your obedience, because of your sacrifice, this is what's happened. And Look so at how many lives it's are gonna so be awesome. changed in this space. We're expanding Guys. our space so more families can have a place to experience real, real life, life change. change. That's right. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 
and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.